You know, today I'll continue uh, sharing a discussion about the whole area of Meredith Church or Methodism as such. I think we have covered a few points. And uh, today we come to another distinctiveness, distinctive uh, sharing or teaching or doctrine of Methodism as such. Yeah, I, I think uh, these are not exclusive to Methodism, but they are distinctive, just to make a, uh, make a note. It doesn't mean that the other people don't believe, uh, but just that uh, John Wesley in his teaching highlighted some of these things. Like yesterday, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, uh, okay, he, his whole body of teaching uh, proposed that. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the area of pervenient grace. Pervenient grace. What exactly is it all about? So today uh, we talk about the whole area of pervenient grace. Uh, it's another term that we hardly ever use in church. I don't think in all my years or any of our years we have heard a sermon on pervenient grace. Okay, uh, but yet it's very uh, distinctive. Uh, John Wesley uh, emphasis. Okay, and help us also to explain why we are so what called Armenian as composed to more Calvinistic. Uh, in the understanding of salvation, okay. So I I will show you uh, the whole area of uh, pervenient grace. Huh? This is a combination of two talks actually. I combine them together. Welcome back to our discussion on the Wesleyan order of salvation or the way of of salvation, depending on which phrase you prefer. Over this series of videos, we'll be talking about prevenient grace, convicting grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Today, in particular, we'll focus our attention on prevenient grace. Prevenient grace was sometimes in Wesley's writing called preventing grace. It's the grace that comes before it. It's the earliest grace that we are recipients of. God bestows this upon us. Uh, as we'll see in our discussion, very, very early in our lives. Now, it's an interesting thing, this whole notion of prevenient grace, because and as Wesley's talking about it, he makes a statement that goes something like this. He says, and it is at this point that we come within a hair's breadth of Calvinism. And then he goes on to say what he means by that. He comes within a hair's breadth of Calvinism in that he wants to attribute all good works to God and only sinful acts to natural humanity. Now think about that for a second. If it's only God who can do good works, if humans can only do evil works, then it seems that the Calvinist conclusion that we are predestined, that God in fact makes the choice about who will be saved and who won't, would be the thing that would follow. That would be the conclusion from seeing things that way. And yet you'll remember what Wesley said is that we come within a hair's breadth of Calvinism. So he wants to affirm those two things about human depravity and about uh, God's goodness. And yet he doesn't want to go all the way with Wesley. Well, it is in fact provenient grace, the concept of provenient grace that enables Wesley to escape the conclusions that the Calvinists do, and that is that we're predetermined as far as our salvation is concerned. So Calvin concludes from this belief that only God can do good works and only humans, or humans can only do evil works, he draws the conclusion that therefore any who are saved have to be saved because God made the decision. Wesley draws a different conclusion and prevenient grace enables him to do that. What he sees prevenient grace as is the intervention of God in our lives in such a way as to be able to overpower the negative effects of sin in our life just enough to free us to be able to respond to God's offer of salvation. He doesn't do it in a way that overpowers our free will. In fact, he does it in a way that empowers our free will. Now, in getting at this, Wesley makes an important distinction. He distinguishes between natural humanity on the one hand and actual humanity on the other hand. What he believes is that natural humans are in fact totally depraved. They would not be able to make uh, of choice for God. They would not be able to do good works. And yet what Wesley believes is that every single person that's born is a recipient of provenient grace. 
a recipient of provenient grace that overcomes the worst effects of their sinfulness to then make them able to be able to respond to God's call. So while natural humanity, if we were born into the world in that state, may in fact be unable to respond to God's offer of grace, Wesley sees provenient grace as moving us to the point where we can respond to that. So actual humanity, all humans born into the world, are the recipients of God's provenient grace. In fact, the biblical reference that he uses to support this idea is that passage in John where he refers to Jesus as the light which enlightens every person. The light which enlightens every person was coming into the world. And so it is through provenient grace that we're enlightened in a way to be able to respond to God's call. So Wesley rescues human free will with this notion of provenient grace. If it weren't for God's gracious intervention at our very birth, at our conception, as we're coming into the world, if it weren't for God's gracious intervention and using provenient grace as a tool to restore enough of our uh, uh, faculties to be able to respond freely to God's offer of salvation, then he would have drawn the same conclusions that, that uh, Calvin did. Provenient grace is the first of the uh, different functions of grace that we'll discuss as we look our way through the order of salvation. Throughout the generations in the life of the church, Christians have wondered about and even debated around the exact mechanisms that are at work when we are saved, particularly how God's grace works on our hearts and minds to lead us to believe. Sometimes this is framed as the grace versus free will debate. Sometimes as Calvinism, Arminianism is as old as the early church when Augustine engaged Pelagius on sin, baptism, and salvation. It is as recent as the summer of 2019 recently when the esteemed John Piper blogged that the Arminian view of prevenient grace is not quite enough of God's grace to lead someone to salvation. So the debate is ongoing. God's people talking about salvation is always a good thing. And prevenient grace deserves all the attention it can get. What is prevenient grace? This is a phenomenon that seems to be described in the Bible, particularly the New Testament, but also the New Testament in salvation stories such as Abraham which depicts our inability to believe that somehow gets us in a position to be able to believe, repent, and exercise saving faith in Christ. It is Galatians, after all, in which Paul says you are saved by grace through faith, and that's not of yourself. It is a gift of God. And so, Pervenian Grace describes the enabling effect that is represented in Scripture, and it seems to be the best way to describe the way that God works on hearts and minds before salvation, that is prevenient. The grace comes to people so that they might be able to believe. The difficulty and the challenges around prevenient grace come because God's people do interpret different verses differently in Scripture. After all, it is Paul in letters like Ephesians who describes that we are dead in sin, as if we can't believe. But at the same time, Paul calls people to repentance and believe and to live lives of righteousness. How do we get from this inability to repent to this ability? The bridge, the answer between the two is in fact, prevenient grace. And so prevenient grace is this phenomenon in the Bible that describes how people who can't repent of their own because they don't want to in their selfishness, that they begin to think about God. And they begin to wonder if God can save them. And that this grace is the thing that actually leads them to the altar of repentance. Prevenient grace is not uncommon in the writings throughout church history but particularly comes to the forefront in the late 16th century. Jacob Arminius is a professor of theology at Leiden, and he is a pastor of a Reformed Church in Amsterdam.
And the prevalent doctrine of the day was this reform belief that we are such sinners that we can't even repent. We don't want to. And this is partnered with the doctrine of unconditional election, that the only way people can be saved is if God predestined them to that salvation. After all, they can't repent. Otherwise, it would be works theology. And so as Arminius began to read the salvation description in the New Testament, he began to describe this phenomenon that God works before prevenient to salvation. It is this total depravity and unconditional election that become the T and the U of the acronym TULIP from the Council of Dort not too long after Arminius, which represents the Reformed or Calvinist view of salvation. It is Wesley in particular, though, who realizes that the New Testament is describing in its verses this actual work of God before salvation. For Wesley, there are four verses that are central to prevenient grace. As I quote them to you, listen to the universal effect, as well as the transformation that begins to take place that sounds like pre-salvation. For Wesley, it is John 1, 9, Jesus is the light that enlightens all mankind. John 12, 32, Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all people to me. Romans 2, 4, do you not know it is God's grace that leads you to salvation? And then Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared to all for salvation. In these verses, Wesley, like Arminius, were able to see that God is working in an advanced fashion, not so different than salvation, and yet somewhat different than that actual moment of repentance, and so honoring that we are saved by grace. And so prevenient grace is enabling it allows all people to be able to believe instead of just some. It is also transformative. It begins to change us to think like God a little bit more so we would want to know him more and that thing that we call salvation. It is universal. It goes to all people and not just a select few. And it is akin to Calvin's common grace, we have to admit. As Calvin recognized that rain falls on the just and unjust, that's the grace of God. When a social worker who may not be a Christian intervenes in a family that needs it, that is grace. Even when an athlete or an actor perform, they can reflect the glory of God and the image that he bestowed on them. But for Calvin, this is not saving and it doesn't lead to saving. And that sets common grace apart from Wesley's Prevenient grace. What prevenient grace is not is it's not unconditional election. It creates the opportunity for all to believe and not just a select few, which by the way, in that system, if a select few are elected, predestined, then others logically at least, if not actually, are predestined to eternal condemnation. Prevenient grace bypasses that and Many Christians do believe it best represents the way God describes salvation in the New Testament. At the other end of the spectrum, prevenient grace is not universalism. Even though there's a universal effect to prevenient grace, it causes people everywhere the opportunity to think about God so that one might walk out of their village in search of the true God, or someone in a church might actually go down to the altar to confront God in salvation. It is not actually saving all people comes to all, but still not all believe. Paul describes this in Romans 1, when the Gentiles should have known their creator, but instead of putting him central in worship, they put a bird, a golden calf. And so as a result, they are not recognized for their belief, but rather for their unbelief. And because of prevenient grace, all are judged for their unbelief or their belief in Christ. Prevenient grace. Grace is a wonderful thing, and whenever it comes to us in any form, we should be quite thankful and rejoice in God, even if we don't necessarily, we seem to forget that God doesn't departmentalize grace. This is all the same grace for the same purpose, to make us like his son. Sometimes we describe it in categories, even prevenient grace that doesn't occur in the Bible, because that's how we receive it, because of the effect that it can have on us. Prevenient grace helps us to 
see that verses like John 3.16, whosoever believes can have eternal life is the best way of describing salvation in the Bible. It's universal, it's transformative, and it comes to all so that any can believe and not just a select. 2 Corinthians 9.8 says, May the grace of God abound to you all, and I hope that for all of you. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, uh, I know that uh, both of these uh, videos were a bit heavy, okay, but uh, I thought the second, uh, second one was quite good, uh, giving the Bible verses and all that to explain uh, Pervinian Grace a bit clearer. Okay, a bit clearer. Uh, so, Pervinian Grace is just something that's a term we use not from the Bible, to explain how a person, a sinful person, can be touched and want to accept God and repent. Because according to Calvin's uh, uh, understanding theology, uh, theology of it, it says that all people are predetermined. Means whether you have to be saved or not to be saved, uh, is already determined by God. Okay, so, so according to Kelvin, it's predetermined. Whatever you do, it doesn't matter. God is determined to save you or not to save you. Okay, and this uh, sometimes live into a gem. So you have people who say that whether I come to church, believe it or not, it doesn't matter. If God is determined to save me, God will save me. If God decides not to save me, God will not save. No matter what I do, I cannot be saved. Uh, so that becomes a problem. Okay, of the whole area of Calvinism, where everything is predetermined. But uh, this pastor Aminis, okay, uh, uh, in Amsterdam, that we talked about just now, and John Wesley uh, pushed it a bit differently. They said God was at work even while we are yet sinners. His grace was still at work, and this is called pervidian grace, means grace before you believe. And that allows people to respond. Whether you respond or not is still your decision. Uh, so it's very different from predetermined salvation. Predetermined means God has determined who to save, who not to save. But pervenient grace allows everyone to decide. Means God's grace is working in your life. It's up to you to respond to God's grace and to repent and to accept Christ. That is the big difference between uh, this whole understanding of Pervinian grace uh, that's very critical and central uh, to hold this whole area of salvation. 